officially, I think that means that we're on. Um, hi, my name is Steve Rifkin. Uh, my G.O. handle is Stevenator. Um, no particular reason. And there we go. There's our first slide. Uh, so I was the one who originally proposed both of these sessions. Uh, BT Mash, Ashok Modi, had pr uh, done a display suite setting that... Um, uh, or a presentation at a, a Drupal LA meeting, and uh, I didn't want to trample on his toes, but at the same time, I have been using Display Suite for a good bit of time now, um, and it's my go-to uh, because I'm a developer. I don't like struggling in the theming layer. Uh, I know it pretty well at this point, but this really gets me from soup to nuts using Display Suite as quickly as possible. Um, I have all sorts of overrides, uh, uh, the bottom line there is the, the real thing I want to stress before we begin is these, these opinions are entirely my own. They may not be best practices sometimes. They, I try to make them most of the time because ultimately I'd like to reuse code uh, on other sites, obviously making me more efficient on uh, jobs as I, I work through my learning process. Uh, but uh, I'm open to suggestions as we talk through this today uh, because I'd like to hear from other people that have also used Display Suite and are using them in production environments uh, to make it to make it happen, basically. Um, so, uh, what else can I say about myself? My handle on Twitter, Steve Rifkin. Uh, I am a freelancer, uh, but I am now beginning to work with Exaltation of Larks uh, and uh, some of the larger enterprise enterprise clients that they have. And uh, I uh, uh, invite you to join them at their gold sponsor table uh, out front. I think their silver sponsor, excuse me, at their silver sponsor table out front. Okay, so the outline today. Uh, I'm going to go through the slides really quickly because ultimately we can talk, but I really enjoy presentations that are about code, that are about people using the actual code, so we're going to get to that as quickly as possible. So if your question is not pertaining directly to what's at hand and maybe is a little outside of the scope, save it for the end and we'll, 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 we'll try to discuss it as we go. Um, so we did that. Uh, so the topics that I'm going to go through... Uh, we're going to talk about Display Suite 6 today because the site that I will be presenting, uh, psav.com, is, uh, is in Drupal 6 using uh, Display Suite. Um, I'm also using VCS to really manage my workflow uh, to help me to deploy to uh, a tr pretty traditional development workflow of having, a dev having my local site, having my dev site, my QA site, and then an actual production site. Uh, one of the things that my background comes from, I, I did uh, when I started dealing with frameworks, one of the first frameworks I came across was Ruby on Rails. Um, uh, loved it, loved everything it offered, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about how my uh, learning curve in Drupal was uh, hampered because of some of the assumptions I knew about uh, programming with proper migrations and things like that versus actually doing a lot of database configuration so um, uh, and having actual settings in the database rather than in code, and how, we, how do we get those out, and, and really how do we, we work with them using all of those settings and not messing up our production site by ever having to migrate a database, merge a database, good God. Um, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk a lot about uh, features in Drush with that, and then of course I'll present the site. Okay, so why Display Suite? Because you know everybody's talking about it, but you don't have to go with Display Suite. Drupal's got a great theming engine in there. Um, but these are some of the decisions that I made using this particular site. So every, every one of these you've got to approach differently and ask yourself, is this really the right tool for this job? Uh, I find that a lot of the mistakes that I make when developing is I come in with an assumption. I want to get it done fast. I know this stretch of the highway already, and I'm going to use this. And maybe I should have taken a step back and thought about what really I should be doing with this particular client, this particular site. So uh, I, I know that it's a best practice for most, but ultimately the idea here is that the more time you spend with your client up front talking about their specific needs, the more time you save yourself on the back end. So uh, my particular choices for Display Suite was what we talked about right at the end of the last session was the ND build mode switching. Uh, you can do it by context, but these guys really wanted to have the ability to let their content editors, anybody who had permissions to create a certain content type, to be able to switch it for the site. Uh, and we'll talk about the reasons why in a second. Code fields. Wow. What a big, big step up for me when I saw these code fields and I was like, wait, I can just do this right here. I don't have to code a specific node TPL for every single thing I'm using. Oh my goodness. Where's the Kool-Aid? <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was one of the other big things. And then as we come down, Display Suite offers hooks. 
Uh, as a developer, uh, uh, just a show of hands, everybody knows what hooks are in Drupal. Does anybody here not know what a hook is in Drupal? Don't be afraid to show your hand. Okay, so um, hooks are a way of allowing other modules to participate in the party. I think that's the best way to say it. So Drupal has some standard hooks. Uh, one of them that I came to first because I needed to alter the user register form is hook form alter. So you would replace the word hook with your module's name or uh, wherever it is that you're in the namespace of in Drupal. So if my module was example mod, dot module, it would be example underscore form underscore alter and then passing in some variables to that will give you access right then and there to all of the, uh, the, the, the array settings of what's on the page and you can alter them before Drupal will pass it off to the theming layer. Um, uh, again, DS also offers its own API, being able to build your own plugins for Dr Display Suite. Uh, Views is very similar to that, um, and uh, that has a lot to do with C tools. Uh, okay, so yeah, down there, one of my big reasons for Display Suite, the client can participate. Now, there are going to be some gotchas in here about that main thing that I've learned over time, is that when I involve my client, and they start clicking around in the browser, or if they think they've got a themer in their, in their company that may not know Drupal, uh, and you give them a drag-drop interface, you got to watch what they're doing, uh, especially if it's up on the production site. Because if you're using features to migrate code up to your production site, and they've mo modified the template on the production site, that's going to be a big gotcha, and you got to be looking for that. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about the scenario in a second. Uh, okay, style fields, styles, styles, and, and, and uh, display suites style section. This was a big thing for me as well. I love to use the 960 grid theme. Uh, um, not only for 960, but I love switching the 960 grid theme into the fluid layouts with percentages and then setting an absolute width on the page wrapper. So now I have like 1020 grid theme, uh, which, is, which is great. So it all operates together and it still all functions like 960 would and it's a great workaround to, to manage your code or, or manage your theme in a way. Now to get that to work with Display Suite, it took some serious... Uh, 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 widgetry on the part of the themer, which was me in this case, but uh, uh, to make the 960 styles work. Uh, does everybody know what a push-pull content layout is? Does everybody know what push-pulling is? Is there anybody who doesn't? Do I need to cover that? Okay. Uh, this is more for SEO implications. Pushing and pulling content is about changing the way that your HTML markup comes in the ordering on the page. So usually when you write HTML markup, you've got your header, then you're going to float your column left, you're going to float your column right, and boom, your content comes up to this, uh, the top of the page. But in SEO, sometimes that's not what you want. Sometimes the content of the page is more important. And you want that content to be in the HTML markup first. So that Google, or whoever's coming by to take a peek at what you've got there, realizes that, oh, top of the page, more important stuff here. We're going to rank that a little more important. That's what a push and pull is, so that when you insert a comment that may pull your left sidebar back. Actually, so, so let me actually say it more in words here. Uh, so in, in a push-pull layout, you would do header, and then your content, and then your sidebar left, sidebar right. And what you're going to do is you're going to set the margins and the, uh, yeah, your margins to either be negative or positive to push and pull stuff out of the way so that visually your markup looks the same, but in the ordering of the actual HTML, you've reversed it so that you get better SEO statistics. There are a lot of themes right out of the box for Drupal that does this. Off the top of my head, Fusion, Zen Theme, 960, all of these work that way, and I believe the future of theming is going to be this. So if you're using a theme that you designed yourself, uh, you may want to reconsider and look at some themes that offer push-pull with theming. Uh, okay, so the last one here, Views and Node Attach. So uh, um, does anybody have any experience before with Node Attach? It's different from Attachments. Uh, attachments was what we were just talking about the last session at the end where if you wanted, say, your first row of the query to be returned as a, a full render of the node, so it's like highlighted or you have some custom highlight for your home page, and then the next five rows are all teaser views. So that's attachment in views. Node attach is another module that you can use to build a view and have the view uh, uh, display, like a page or a block, be an attachment to a node display. So it's actually telling views, hey, every time we, we render this node, I want you to attach this view to the node. So for instance, if I had a cookbook, uh, or, or like here, say we have presenters, right? We have co-presenters. So the node view 
would have been the, the actual presentation. And we could have an attachment on that node using node attach, lining them up underneath of all the presenters, saying, I want a teaser of this presenter's profile picture, and da 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 da. And you can attach that to the node through views. And every time you view a presentation, all of the presenters are there as well. Well, one of the cool things with Display Suite is Display Suite will recognize that. It'll see that you want that, and it will offer you that views attach in the Display Suite drag and drop interface. So it is really powerful to say, oh my gosh, this views attach now is going to be an actual fieldable object on my Display Suite interface in the configuration. Um, I believe I have some of that hooked up in here, and if not, we can get it going real quick. Why not Display Suite? We haven't really said any of that yet in either of these two presentations. So I did want to pause and I want to take a, a moment that you should consider this is not just the everything end all be all. You do need to take some, uh, some, some, some thoughts into consideration here. So uh, why use another set of modules when the TPL file can do just the same? Well, my arguments in the last uh, slide were basically about my client. And this is kind of the qualifications that they had. And if they don't have an in-house themer, if they don't have someone who knows the Drupal framework, Trying to teach them how to use TPL files might be a little too difficult. So this is, works right out of the box, right? Now, there are some performance implications, and we were talking about that at the end so, uh, of the last session. So I really won't go too far into that except to say uh, realize.b, the, the guys who uh, maintain and develop this module, uh, they have a full benchmark uh, uh, page on their site, and that is the link. I will post these slides so uh, uh, you guys can get those. Um, Custom templates only in D7. So D6, I had to figure out some workarounds because this site really, really needed some custom templates. So I thought, hey, build modes can do that. And uh, maybe with a little bit of a CSS finesse, we can make this three column view into this column view or that column view. And you, you guys will see a little bit of that. Uh, ooh, panels and the panels everywhere crowd. Uh, there's a real strong movement in the Drupal community if you read online that you know, there really is no page layout. It's just panels with blocks of content, and you could stick them wherever you want, and there's a whole philosophy behind that. So look into that instead of Display Suite as well. The, uh, the granddaddy of them all, Merlin of Chaos, will be here tomorrow speaking about the panels uh, suite. So I really encourage anybody who <laughs> either hasn't watched one of his videos. I mean, I've seen, like, old videos from Do It With Drupal <laughs> where Earl Miles gets up and talks, and, like, that was my introduction to Drupal. So I'm really excited to see him tomorrow. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the, the blog post below, uh, Display Suite versus Panels, is a nice little write-up about why you would want to choose one versus the other. Uh, they do operate together, though. So, you know, it's not like you have to choose one over the other. But the point is, is that, that I, I don't know the best way to say it. When I'm, when I'm viewing a node, I'm not going to choose usually Display Suite and Panels together, right? The, the node view is going to be taken over by one of those two things, and Display Suite Panel can do both. But, like, say, for instance, if I have a splash page that is a panel, then I can embed my node into that splash page and choose a Display Suite build mode that that node would be viewed as. So very powerful there. Uh, there is also a Lullabot article that I'm uh, um, uh, resourcing. And uh, does anybody else have any reasons why they wouldn't choose Display Suite, Display Suite that I haven't mentioned? Can anybody think of anything? Could there be a memory or just locations just uh, from site to size and running on especially shared or smaller servers? Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, so the, the, the comment was, uh, is, are there memory issues uh, or, or just performance issues in general? Uh, the, the second bullet point there, the benchmarking of that, will speak to some of that. But uh, one thing that's not mentioned, is, as you just brought up, was the size of the site. You know, if you've got a 40-page site that's just static HTML pages that are cached, you've got no problem. But, uh, you know, if you start getting authenticated users and people in there, uh, you may start to see a real performance downgrade. I was going to just throw out uh, display suites a little bit complex also, so uh, we, we have used delta and omega to accomplish a lot of same things. Okay, so uh, the, the comment was that display suite can be complicated, and if you are in Drupal 7, the omega theme uh, with the delta module uh, enabled offers lots of customization, and it's if, if I remember correctly, it's very user friendly, right? It just much more so. yeah. it just makes sense. Yeah, it, it relies on context module. Which Less extra stuff. Sure, so setting the context, that's the second time we've heard that now in the last hour. So uh, uh, getting your context from the context module, looking at what exactly is being done on the site by that viewer at that time, and switching 
the rendering of uh, the template that way. Uh, okay, so uh, th that was my time for any others. Okay, so who here is using Drush? Who here is not using Drush? Kind of Drush? Okay, so we don't have to spend too much time on this. Uh, don't let Drush confuse you. Drush is not a module. Uh, even though it's on the projects page at Drupal, it's not a module. It's actually a command line tool that you would use to uh, speed things up is basically the best way to say it. Um, uh, <laughs> my next bullet point, I, didn't think of, I couldn't think of any other way to tell you the awesome sauce that Drush is. Moshe Weissman, uh, was, uh, he's the maintainer of the Drush module. I believe he also created it. Drush stands for Drupal Shell. Um, and uh, I use all sorts of things with Drush. The biggest one I use is our Drush aliases. <clears throat> so let's actually look at that. Now, I've, I've, I've set up the alias file already, and let me, let me just give you a, a peek into my alias file. Uh, I keep my Drush in my, my home folder, uh, and I use a bash profile uh, alias. Uh, you know, without giving away all of my passwords. There's, so uh, here, uh, I set up a, an alias, and you can see it's just a, an, a contextual array. Uh, that I call this site was uh, River, and uh, uh, it's got a Devel workflow, it's got a production server, and it's got uh, a QA server. So I would be able to come over to the command line and type in something like, and I'm actually going to do uh, one of them here. So the command, and actually I should come back here, sorry. The command is for status in Drush, and I'm now looking onto one of my remote servers just using, and of course nothing comes back, just using my, uh, my, my tag here for my alias. So I'm not going to spend time on this because it's, it's really not the scope of this, but one of the ways that I manage my workflows is to set up an alias for each site that I work on so that I know when I type in that at symbol, I can sync my databases without even having to log into the remote server. I can pull down the, the most recent production database, sanitize it, put it into my local, and I know exactly what we're working on. Another uh, command that I really love, and I'll type this out like this. And uh, let's actually put a, a modifier on there. So our sync is a way of keeping things synced, right? But again, right here, I'm just telling it to our sync the files directory. Uh, my main reason is because in all of my repositories, my files directory is ignored because I don't want to bring the files every single time that I'm trying to do any type of pushing and pulling, especially if they're uploading huge video files. I'm sitting there forever and I'm ready to work. So if I need those files because I'm finally testing the video, I can run this command and it'll bring it all local. It also uh, uh, deflates so zips everything up and is uh, pretty snappy. You should also have it in subdirectories of your file directory and make things even faster. Correct. So uh, you can also uh, give more parameters to that uh, that uh, replacement string, the percent sign files, and uh, you can you can really build your workflow, so to speak. Uh, just to highlight the other commands that I'm use the most. Uh, so Drush DL is uh, short for download, and uh, DL is basically the way that we can go to the Drupal.org file repository and grab modules like this. Um, so Drush DL, uh, and let's uh, let's see if we can get this one in here. So. Uh, do we know what the name of this module is? Does anybody know? Shorter, Oliver, you did a. So it's giving me an error because I'm not finding the actual module name, but it's th that that is exactly what would happen, and this would download this module right into my site's all modules folder. Views attached. Views attached sorry. Let's, let's see something work here. So I already have it in here, so I'm not going to override it. Yes, this is D6. And uh, I, I should mention that because uh, it will actually look at the version of your Drupal installation and get the right module. Again, it's not going to be any dev version. It will be the most stable release that it's going to pull. You can specify the version. And you can specify the version. Uh, okay, the last uh, few here are um, uh, the really big commands for what I've been using on this site are Drush Feature Update, uh, and I actually meant to put Drush Feature Revert, and we'll talk about what those do, and then of course there's a, a, a another switch you can put in there for actually doing all of them rather than naming the specific feature that you're trying to do. Uh, and then of course is Drush Make. Uh, Drush Make is, uh, uh, basically took my workflow and, and sliced it by like a tenth. 
because I no longer had to build uh, files anymore. I no longer had to keep or maintain uh, uh, code or the actual contrib modules. I could just name it all out in a Drush make file. And I keep my Drush make file in my Drupal site root with all of my sites. And here's a generic dot make. Uh, or how about not opening it with Keynote? How about we do it here? So uh, really simple syntax, the project, the name of the module. You can turn them on and off with se uh, the semicolon. So depending on the site, I just need to walk down this file where I've used most of my modules. If I need a new module, Drush download later, but this will give me my site up and running instantaneously. So Drush and Drush make. Uh, for the next level, if you're looking to step up uh, our, our keys, and uh, I, I think for me to you, I wouldn't waste any time. You should get on this now and, uh, and just start building out your skills a little faster because you're using this. Okay, so features. Um, so as I said, I come from a Ruby on Rails background. I'm very familiar with Capistrano. Uh, which is a uh, deployment tool, and it's a way of setting up deployment scripts in Ruby to uh, do all of the things that are tedious. Download a backup, push your code, check out the latest revision, put it onto the live site, reload the backup, load your migrations, and then put the site back into uh, uh, online mode. Uh, uh, so you can write scripts for that, and I, I just was not, when I got to Drupal, I just was not used to allowing users to click around in the database and put all the configuration in the database. The concept of a variable table was, was pretty foreign to me when I first came into this, uh, although I, I've been using it in other things, but, you know, all of the, the you know, the, your variables table gets to 500, 600, 700, more, depending on the modules you're using to store configuration. Uh, so uh, features was kind of an eye-opener to the fact that there were some great things about development workflow that you could use with this module. Uh, 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 the second line here, Drush feature revert versus feature update, and I'll talk about this one. Uh, it's a big whoops. If you were to type the wrong command on the command line for anything like that, but uh, I don't know if anybody out there is using it. I've done this before where I spend an hour resetting my feature. I've got a new field on my content type. I've got a new this, a new that, new help text. And, and features will export all that for me as we saw at the end of the last session. But the, 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 the problem was is that I hit feature revert. And so it took all of my code that was in the feature and pushed it into the database. Instead of telling the database, hey, take the new code, that would be features update, and it would actually overwrite your features file, your module file, to include any of the updates you had. Uh, so just a, 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 a whoops there. Hook update n uh, for config and schema migrations. I'm actually not using that on this site yet, but I know that the, it's going to be coming, so I thought I'd bring it up. So it would be the name of your feature or module, and you, would, you can start numbering your uh, updates, and that would be, let's say, you know, the name of the content type is page. No, now it's article. No, now it's page again. You can literally put that into a hook update n of one, two, and three, and the site would switch back and forth. So literally, when you up, up, you push your code up onto the server, and you just go and run drush up db or navigate in the browser to your example.com slash update.php, and that will actually update all of the changes that you had. So when you guys see, uh, when you download a contrib module or something, you have to run update.php, sometimes it runs something and sometimes it doesn't. That's usually because it's either, well, it's always because it's migrating a new schema. Maybe the, the module changed, you know, the name of the table or the name of the field that they're calling it. Or maybe they added a new field or removed an old field. That is a way to keep everybody up to date and running all of the schema migrations that go with the database and that particular module. Um, uh, so, uh, hook update n is a great way to keep your workflow going like that. The standardization of the numbering system for hook updates is to use the, the Drupal core version. So, you if you use run six, Drupal 6, okay. you use 6001, mm -hmm. 6002. If you run Drupal 7, you'd have 7001, 7002. And that way, all of these can exist in the same file inside of your module, and you can see the chronological order of how your site has changed over time. Correct. So just to repeat that, the, the standards are to actually use the version of Drupal in your hook update n as the first number. Uh, so obviously we want to have less than 999 updates, right? 
Uh, okay, so uh, diff module using features. I'm going to show that right now too. So it's just a way of using the diff commands in the command line through uh, features to show you, hey, these are the actual changes that are about to be made. Uh, and then the last thing is that features is not uh, the end all be all either. So uh, Lullabot just uh, had a, a podcast with Lullabot Voices about two months ago uh, talking about features and why features was developed. And it was more about grouping and uh, exporting a certain set of stuff so that you can use it on another site. It wasn't necessarily to be used as a workflow concept or a workflow module. Most people just happen to use it that way. So in a combination of using features and in a combination of using hook update N, I'm allowed to get a good workflow migration together for the site. Uh, okay, Git is your friend. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on Git, but Git versus SVN. Uh, I started with Subversion. I started uh, a long time ago, uh, CVS as well. Uh, but uh, Git, one of the main things I love about Git is I'm not having to delete those little .svn files out of every single directory. Uh, that is what controls the versioning in Subversion, and Git does it all the way up at the top of the directory root. So that was really one of my big things. Drupal just migrated to Git, so another reason to pick Git versus SVN. Uh, Git commit, push, and pull are, are major commands. And then the big ones for me in my development workflow are Git branch. You can use all sorts of experimental stuff on a, a branch. You can merge that in or not, and uh, that's just basic uh, version control stuff. So, all right, here's my workflow. I went from a dev site to a Q&A site to a live site, all using branches. Those are the keys and using features. Um, I don't think that you guys will have too many questions on that because we're going to get to the site now. Okay, so uh, psav.com. Let's actually show the site. And uh, I'm logged in, so we've got some things going on with it. But all sorts of little widgety stuff on the site, making it uh, really kind of neat. Uh, we've got views slideshow running these uh, rotating banners here. Um, and then, of course, uh, we've got actual HTML5 video, and I'm using the Media Elements JS player with this one. Uh, Media Elements JS was not available for Drupal 6. Someone has written a module for Drupal 7. I'm considering backporting this for Drupal 6 because I have a full working player in Drupal 6. Um, okay, so uh, let's go back to the slide and talk about uh, the deal with this site and why uh, I think it's a great case study for some of this. Uh, a lot of things that I've run across uh, are usual, you know, standard websites. People want, you know, to put their content on the page, organize their content in their logical format and stuff like that. These guys wanted a marketing site. So they wanted more of like this. I, I feel like the designer I was working on with this was like a, an old school, like quark designer and like only new page layout. <laughs> you know, like the page did the concept of like the text expanding beyond the bottom of the page. She was like, no, 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 we just we scale the text. We'll just make it smaller, fit in the box. I was like, oh, that's convenient for you. Uh, maybe we should keep a consistent font size in this section so we're not, we're not painfully trying to figure out what we need to do in every section. So uh, that, it was a bit of a, um, yeah, it, it harshed my mellow when Drupal programming on this one. So uh, these guys, yeah, they wanted a marketing site. So they had these page-like content types that uh, we called miscellaneous pages, we called service pages, and we called spotlight pages. And each set of these things were to share certain build modes in, in Display Suite and also have their own build modes in Display Suite and only allowing certain content editors to use certain build modes on certain contexts. Yeah, the permutations were pretty much endless and we're still kind of figuring this out because ultimately uh, I have three content types with about 10 build modes each. So you can see that that's 30 in the permutation of how many uh, 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 content uh, layouts that you can look at here and literally each one has its own CSS you can you can do anything you want with each one of them and we'll look at that uh, solar search was on here another thing many users we had authenticated users so the uh, the concept of the benchmarking was huge for us uh, so I, I, I really didn't pay attention to it I just installed memcache <laughs> hey is it still slow all right now let's figure it out right okay <laughs> So uh, that was one way to get around that, and uh, I don't, you know, it's not the best practice, but uh, ultimately it gets you from A to B. So again, it's a soup to nuts approach here today. Uh, yeah, so we already talked about the easy way to do a custom theme on the content because of Display Suite. In the last requirements, we are using, what is a CND? <laughs> it's, it's 
the Canadian version of a content distribution <laughs> network. So we are using AWS, Amazon's, uh, Amazon's uh, installation uh, and their nodes around the world uh, to distribute their uh, content and their video. Uh, it's called CloudFront and it is an origin pull. Uh, uh, origin pull basically means that uh, depending on the cache headers, how long uh, that uh, uh, service holds your content in its memory around the world, uh, uh, it will then go back and pull another version of it at some point. So uh, there is uh, some, some implications on that. Like if they post a new video and they want it online immediately and they messed up and they post another video, uh-oh. If that video got into the CDN, they may have to wait a day to take care of that. Now, there are modules that will refresh the CDN's cache or name the file differently so it's serving a different file name so it's not in the CDN. Uh, does anybody want to discuss CDNs or can I just move forward? Good. Uh, move forward. You want to ask a question? Oh, I have this one. Kind of process of integrating Drupal with uh, CDNs. I have access to, I think it's called Lightwave mm -hmm. CDNs. Um, we're kind of coming into the process where we have so much user contributed content that is next step video, et cetera, currently mostly images, et cetera, that we're having trouble with our website. So, so the, the biggest gain from a CDN, and I believe that's really where that question is, is directed at, is, is, is about the performance of your server. Because basically when someone opens a web page, you're, you're asking the server to bootstrap Drupal uh, unless you've cached the page, right? So Drupal's going to look up all the stuff that it's supposed to display, what build mode you're in, what views you need to query, and all that kind of stuff. And then it spits it back to the theming layer to then deliver the HTML, right? So that's the first part. But then all of a sudden, the, the, the user gets the HTML, and now all of these calls back to these CSS style sheets, these JS JavaScript sheets, images, video, anything else, you're pulling off the same box usually, unless you're hosting your files on a different server and it's pointed that way. So basically, a CDN is a way to offload that resource hog, which is serving other files, to a different server, or in the concept of real high-end CDNs like Akamai, uh, to, to, to get it all over the world as quickly as possible. So if your video goes viral and you've got a million hits in 10 minutes, your site doesn't crash because all of those 10 million hits are serving the heavy files from somewhere else, right? So your site is still able to build, your author, uh, authorized users are still in. Uh, there's a great uh, Drupal uh, Voices uh, podcast from Lobot about Grammy.com and how they use Akamai to deliver the weekend of the Grammys, where they were literally getting 10 million hits an hour. So uh, definitely something to look into if you're, uh, you're looking at something like that. Sure, go ahead. Um, are you still managing your files on your side the same way? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we can get off into a tangent here, so I'm going to be careful not to. But ultimately, yes, we still upload our files. Uh, the, the simplest way to do a CDN is to use a C name with a different subdomain. So in this particular site, my CDM is media.psav.com. Media points to the Amazon server. Amazon server knows that it looks back to my regular domain to source the file. If it doesn't have it, once it has it, it holds that file in its memory, depending on where in the world it was served. So let's say I've got a conference in Chicago and they've got a server farm there in Chicago. All of that content will be served from the, most, the, the closest node bank of the CDN, so it would all come from Chicago. If I got a conference in Europe, which this site did the other day, we're serving files over there in Europe, and it's much faster for the user to download the files from Europe than having to wait for my LA server to spin up some video for them. Cool. Uh, Display Suite, here they are. So, uh, Drush Download, DS, VD, ND, ND Contrib, and NDCCKs. The, the, these are the, the, the suite of modules that I found to be the most useful using Display Suite. Uh, there's no need really to discuss them other than to show them, but I wanted to get them in there for the slide so you guys had more information when I posted these. Yeah, whoo, let's, uh, let's not do that stuff. Oh, yeah. So we'll come back to the gotchas page, and since I don't have to come back here, I just wanted to list in my footnotes. These are the projects I'm talking about. Uh, these are some, uh, for those of you getting started, uh, Bob at Mustard Seed. Is, who's, who's not watched Bob? Come on. We've all watched Bob. I've, I've, I've bought Bob. I'm hoping I bought Bob a couple beers, but... Uh, uh, the, the idea here is that uh, he's got two levels of Display Suite, and this was really instrumental into me making a commitment into Display Suite. So I encourage you to watch those two videos, uh, the, the first and third bullet points there. Uh, and then uh, uh, East Garden has got uh, uh, the introduction to Display Suite. Uh, and then the last one down there at the bottom, the last two, 
these are some higher end um, uh, 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 tutorials. The, the, the small one down there, really at the bottom, leveraging views and display suite, really cracked open the idea in the code for me of like, oh, wow, I can switch what view, what the view is calling. I can pass in different arguments this way and that way. And it really makes display suite a lot more dynamic. Uh, something that I, ha I found to be uh, difficult when I was just using the configuration side in the Drupal browser. So again, more dynamic when you go to code because I can write an actual if condition or a switch statement right there in my code rather than having to do it somewhere else. Okay, so the site. Um, so this is the display suite landing page. Uh, uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time because we went through this in the last session. So if you guys have questions, bring them up later because basically we're assuming you're beyond this, this piece of it. Uh, okay, so here's the first uh, big thing for me and that I'm going to be using today because I'm using a 960 grid sub-theme. Uh, display suite and I'm down here in layout styles. So pretty much for all of my sites when I unpack a feature, I put all of the 960 grid styles into my display suite both my uh, fields and my regions, because then I can use the display suite drag and drop interface to grab these, these commands. Uh, does anybody not know what grid theme is? So, all right, good. Uh, so we're gonna see a lot of this in the next few uh, screens. No displays, uh, this basically tells you right here about the custom templates you can use. Now you gotta remember that you've gotta have a node TPL file in your theme in order to put an ND TPL file in. So it first looks for the Drupal default and then we'll use the display suite TPL file. So that's a gotcha right there. So if you don't bring the no TPL file in, display suite won't wake up. It won't take your hello world H1 tag while you're trying to refresh the browser 20 times. Why won't you work? Um, okay, my fields for these pages, okay? So I've got a few in here. And uh, let me show you one of the pages so you can kind of understand what was going on here. Here's one. Uh, I'm going to step away because it's easier for me to go here. So they had basically a two-column, uh, three-column, two-row view that we wanted to slice up a bunch at a time. So sometimes they wanted long fields, like we're, we would call them skyscrapers, and sometimes they wanted six boxes. And so I was delivered a template file. Where are you? Boom, boom, and PDFs. Like this. And uh, let's see if I can make that a little bit bigger. So I looked at this in my initial meeting with the client, and immediately my, my brain goes, display suite. Because I can see that as I scroll down these pictures, I mean, how do you do this without creating 30 different TPL files? So these were just different ways to allow the user to know what content they had to deliver and then select the template based on their content. So if I've got a couple photos from the event, I'm going to go photo heavy. If I've got uh, more copy, maybe only one photo. If I've got a real nice vertical photo, switch up the layout. So they really wanted some custom uh, changing based on the layout. So uh, now that you've seen that, we can come back here and uh, I'm just gonna show some of these things that uh, I used. Uh, here we go. Uh, so uh, in this case, this was uh, the vertical one and I should probably, I think I have it open here. Here's the actual edit view of this node. So scrolling down to uh, display suite, the build mode settings and I have enabled the build mode uh, module. So just for this particular node type, content type, I've got 10 different templates that the user can choose from. All right? So uh, we're going to go into in a second uh, uh, how I got 10 templates <laughs> instead of doing another 20 of them. There's a real neat little trick we'll show right here at the end of this today that got me really quickly from specking it out and then pushing it to all of my other node types. Uh, so this is on template six, and that was the ordering of stuff. Now, the other thing that I did with these guys was I allowed them to have uh, uh, um, multiple fields in a particular CCK field. So uh, again, this is an array of fields. If anybody's ever DPM'd uh, their node object and they see field foo, 
You can see fields foo has the option of 0, 1, 2, 3 in your index so that you can have four fields or, or four uh, um, yeah, inputs on one field. And I allowed them to do that because it, A, it's the simplest, I thought, and B, because it really worked in our uh, interface for the content editors. So this is the copy field. And in this particular uh, uh, piece, we've got two copy fields. So the problem was, is how do I tell Display Suite? Let's go to one of these. It was six, right? How do I tell Display Suite when uh, Drupal only knows its copy field? It's just called copy. How does it know which field to put where? Well, Drupal really doesn't. It'll actually spit out every iteration of that copy field wherever you tell it to be put onto the node. So I had to use the code fields to literally call the individual copy fields that the user would be placing around the template. So here you can see that in the left side, I've got a, a combo field that I created of the title and the copy. And then here below, I've got copy two on the right side. So let's go and see what's running that. So there's copy one and copy two, and down here's my combo field. Let's look at one of these guys. There it is. Okay, so one of the gotchas that I listed, and I'll go over it now since uh, I'm starting to run short on time, uh, is when you check these boxes, this is excluding things, not including things. Something a little different for me with a checkbox when I, you know, did an RTFM uh, for specifically Display Suite. But uh, here I'm just excluding all of these content types except for the ones that are unchecked. So that's the way to read that. Um, and down below, it's just straight up HTML and PHP. Uh, you can read down here. It gives you the instructions, but there it is right there. So Display Suite is telling you, uh, usually on our node TPLs, it's dollar sign node is our object for the node. But here, the object is called object. So I believe they do that for later on in Dis uh, Display Suite 7, where it could be a comment rather than a node. So the, the concept of an object is really what it is. So here I'm printing the object's title in the H1 tag. And then underneath, I'm printing the object field copy array index 1. So that's my first copy field that I'm putting with it. And then, of course, uh, in the next one, uh, copy field 2 would be copy, field copy array index 1. And that's how I'm getting around the page to allow my user, here we go, to allow my user to see all this stuff and to drag and drop. So if I go below in the disabled, you can see everything else. There's copy 3 and 4. There are these small images, 1, 2, 3. I've got a video in here, related video that they can use. And then the last thing I'll mention about the actual layout is remember that part where I said I stuck all my 960 grid theme styles into the page? Check this out. So right here, it's bringing those into the region. So I can be pushing and pulling my content using grids, uh, grid standards of prefix and suffix. I've got all sorts of uh, options available to me to rewrite Display Suite's regions using only CSS. Now that is a Display Suite 6 limitation. Display Suite 7, as Joe Chelman just presented here, has custom templates. So if you haven't made the choice, Display Suite 7 offers a lot more uh, flexibility. But if you're creative, you can get around it, right? So uh, that's how I was able to uh, produce all of these different layouts. OK, so um, the last pieces of this I want to show you is uh, the reason why I brought this up, because I thought it was pretty nifty when I decided to use features. And uh, uh, for again, it's, it's the way to export the content. Features will actually build. will build some pages for me. And here is uh, uh, features.ds.inc. So any exportable will come with a .inc file that relates to that section of the river, so to speak. So field groups have exportable stuff. Content, so CCK has an exportable file. Uh, and you know, views has one. And you can kind of see down below here in the right-hand column that there are, uh, there are some, some specific exportables that are being used. Okay, So I've basically gone down into the Display Suite settings. 
And I'm, I'm now on this page content called miscellaneous. And I don't want to take my highlighting off, but there it is right there, right? And so now you can see my actual keys for these build modes. There's, there's number one. Scrolling, 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 scrolling. Here comes number two. So on and so forth. So what did I do? I copied one through ten, changed the name from miscellaneous to spotlight or to service, and pasted it at the bottom of this file. Update my feature, 30 templates. Just like that. Turn to git, git push, bam, they're all up on the site, client is ready to use them, client is excited about what you've done for them, and you did it in like 90 minutes. So that is really why I wanted to present on this because of this little nifty trick that all of a sudden I was like, wow, this just took away so much work that I used to click around in the browser and do. So if anything you get out of this uh, is do it once, put it into a feature, find out how that feature uses it, and then migrate it over to whatever else you're using, whether you're going to use it somewhere else on a different site or whether you're going to use it over and over again in this particular site. One of the other things I do want to point out about features is feature is a module. It's an actual module. So you get a dot module file, and when you update your feature, feature is really only looking for the dot inc files. So in this folder here, PSAV content types, actually it's not a good one to look at. Let's look at this one here, locations. So look at this one. I've got a CSS file in there. I've got a JS file in there. When I update my feature using Drush feature update PSAV underscore locations, it's only going to overwrite the feature-specific files. It's going to leave my module files alone. So I don't have to worry about putting all sorts of module-specific stuff into the feature file. It's a real big benefit and really moves your uh, site along. So uh, one of the things I was able to do with the content types was, of course, build my, build my video, which is right here. This is the uh, wrapper that I built for my video. And once I have that function together, I can come back to my node display fields. And right here I have feeder video. Uh, let's, let's do the big one right here. This would be on any major page that I have. Right here in code, all I have to do is call my video object, uh, my video function. And where is it? Here it is, right there. So I'm just using the display suite object. Got my video function from the module. Bam, video player. So again, the code fields are so easy to do. Now, once you do it once and you get how your feature is working, there's really no reason to come back here. Everything, I would just search for the function's name in my, dis in my display suite.inc file, and I would update whatever I needed to there. Saves you so much more time than having to click, wait, click update, click this, click that, make a few changes, do a search, find replace all, save, git push, and you're off and running. One more thing I was going to show as an example here is from a different site, uh, using Display Suites fields, uh, field groups, um, and let me open that page while I'm showing this. So uh, this is a site that had all sorts of widgetry on the page. Uh, but down here are some nice tabs, and uh, Display Suite created all of that for me. I didn't actually have to do anything. Now, I've created lots of jQuery UI tabs interfaces before, but the tabs module with Display Suite, bam. I feel like Emerald Lagasse. <laughs> bam. So here are my uh, actual uh, field groups that I created, cast, crew, chapter, still, windowing information, rating, pricing. Right here, cast, crew, chapter, still, rating. Didn't have to do anything. Literally, just put it together, drag everything into the interface, and down here below, in my footer, there it is. Cast, crew, chapter. Check this out over here. The field format is going to be tabs. So I used the tabs module, and <laughs> bam, there it was. So once again, very simple stuff, leveraging Display Suite to immediately have the interface that you're looking for, and you can spend more time with your client figuring out what it is that you're not going to do for them. <laughs> and then right before the site launches, say, all right, maybe you were right on that one. Because you know, ultimately, we all know I just spent 20 hours building this out. Oh, you don't want that anymore. Great. <laughs> so 
so again, this is more about spending time uh, on the things that are necessary. Uh, so I'm just trying to think if there was uh, one more screen here that I wanted to show. Yeah, so uh, I'm in features, and remember I was talking about the diff module? So uh, features will uh, notify you if anything's overridden or is in conflict and needs review, and I've opened up a screen like that here. So uh, if you don't have the diff module installed when you come here, your, point, your uh, cursor won't go to pointer. But if you do, you can click on this, and it will show you exactly what the differences are, what line they're on, and you can go track them down and make sure that you're picking the right one. So remember in the beginning how I was saying that one of the gotchas is if you do allow users on your display suite on the live site and somebody does have the know-how to come into the interface and maybe say, I want the links on the left side, not the right. Well, they've just modified the content. They've just modified your feature. Now, they didn't know that. But ultimately, if I'd go and modify it, push my code up, and hit feature revert, their styling just went away because I just loaded my code styles back up into the database, okay? One more thing about this, I, I can't believe we didn't even mention. If I get my display suite configurations into code, I can use things like APC, opcode caches, to really boost the performance rather than Drupal having to read every time what the configuration is of that build mode in order to cache it. And then it's coming from your cache tables rather than an actual uh, uh, a performance enhancement like APC, memcache, things like that. Um, so I think I should stop there. We've got four minutes. Are there questions about uh, the way I implemented things? Uh, I wish I had more time. You guys can click around and see uh, some of the pages here. Uh, and, and let me just go through these eight to show you uh, uh, how this happened and why this happened. Uh, and while I'm answering questions, I'll just be clicking through and you guys can see the build modes change as I go. So questions? Are you letting the clients access the display suite configuration pages or are they just picking different build modes within the uh, It depends on the permissions. So if, if it's, it's, it's two things. First, if the client has uh, uh, permissions to create the content, right, they would get access to it. And then if the context is correct in that build mode, they will have the toggle that gives them the templates. So, so, so yes is the answer for the node side, right? And then certain, uh, certain users have the ability to uh, use the content, let me say this correctly, a certain users have the ability to actually administer the display suite settings as well. And I have let them do that. But literally, I need to look on my QA site to see if they've been playing with it, because I want to merge my changes with their changes and see what conflicts come up. Because I may be told one thing by my PM, and then their marketing team has done four other things. And I'm, you know, six days down the food chain. I'm not going to find out about it unless I'm looking at the site. So you can see these, uh, these pages are just changing, and this is all display suite. It's all one node content type. I'm doing it all out of one place. So any other questions there? All right, well, this concludes my presentation of advanced display suites, and uh, I thank you for your time.